April 3rd, 1993, I was participating in a military training exercise. And, and this is an exercise where we use a lot of explosives in our training, utilizing rock quarries. We had three explosions to do that day in the morning. And it was shortly after we set the fuses on that third and final blast of the day, we would get in our vehicles, we'd convoy down to a safety staging area. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Into the Pit. And I am fortunate enough to have Mr. Todd Neese and Mr. Adam Porter here with me. And we are going to talk cryptids today, especially uh, Bigfoot. And uh, Adam actually caught some evidence on camera. We're having a discussion on it. And I'm going to share the video at the end so you can see it better. Unfortunately, the way we play it when we share the screen, it doesn't come up quite as clear. And if you would, you'll have to probably watch it on a TV screen or your computer screen to see it better. But getting all that out of the way, um, Todd, I understand you've got a new documentary out. Um. Well, I wouldn't necessarily call it mine. I, I certainly was a participant in it uh, starting back a year and a half ago. Uh, in fact, in the beginning of the documentary, I'm about 20 pounds heavier, so it wasn't too good of continuity by the time we got to the end. But anyway, it was a lot of fun. Uh, we filmed some of it up here at my home, up here on Mount Hood in the Cascade Mountains east of Portland, and uh, uh, some out on some property I own. Uh, about a mile or two from here and uh, very very well put together it's already uh, been out three and a half weeks it's already the second most downloaded documentary on uh, on uh, Amazon Prime anyway um, it's on about eight different platforms so I'm sure your your guests can can look it up google it what have you but uh, it's called a flash of beauty Bigfoot revealed and they're already working on a sequel to it, uh, Flash of Beauty, Paranormal Bigfoot. So hoping to get involved with that one as well. But thank you for bringing that up. Oh, yeah. Um, have you done any television lately? I just returned from uh, Buffalo, New York, where they filmed uh, a sequence for an upcoming uh, series that's coming out. Uh, it's called Mission Unexplained, mm -hmm. and uh, we spent a good day on it. Um, but it, uh, it, like I say, it hasn't come out yet. They're they're basically pitching it to some distributors right now. And uh, but these folks are well connected. They have offices in New York, Los Angeles, and Vancouver, BC. And uh, when they get a project going uh, generally goes through it gets picked up so i'm looking forward for that to come out um other than that it's been well about a year ago i was on uh the history channels um unexplained with william shatner oh, and they flew me, flew me down to hollywood and give me the royal treatment and we went up in the hollywood hills there and filmed for several hours in 94 degree weather uh it was hot. It was muggy. The mosquitoes were hungry. It was, uh, it was, it was something, but, uh, yeah, that came out uh, in February and that's, uh, doing very well as, as well. And I've got, I've just signed a contract, as you know, with, uh, a, a, a production company that's going to put together a series that, that they want me to be a, a cast member on, um, I thought we weren't going to film until spring, but it sounds like they've got a distributor set up and we may be filming a little sooner than that. So um, I'm, that's going to be a whole different can of worms for me because they said be expected on be on the road for five to six months. Wow. And traveling everywhere. And, but it's, it's not Bigfoot specific. It's cryptozoological. Right. Uh, the concept's pretty cool. Um, I won't get into it uh, here just because um, those folks are, you know, they don't want anybody stealing their ideas before of they course. get the pit, that pitch out. But uh, um, 
I don't even think there's a working title yet, but uh, it's going to be fun to finally be a cast member as opposed to just uh, an appearance on a show. So anyway, so that's coming. So yeah, things are moving along. Sweet. You said 94 degree weather. So that's a cool day here in Texas. <laughs> oh, well, this is in Los Angeles and it was muggy. <laughs> Yeah, you ask Adam down there around Houston, I mean, it mm. gets humid. And... Oh, it just rained yesterday, and uh, the only thing it did was make it 20% more humidity. Mm. Wow. Mm. Well, I'll be in Arkansas for the next couple of weeks, so uh, I'm sure to get a taste of that. Absolutely. <laughs> well, um, Adam, what have you been up to lately? Uh, not much, just kind of keeping around the homestead uh work's got me tied to the night shift so my uh day adventures have kind of been put on hold for a little bit unfortunately well, yeah well a couple months ago you came up here to visit and then on the way home you actually caught something that uh we're going to talk about yeah it was your... completely unexpected i <laughs> i still don't even know what to say about it to be honest with you it's uh I haven't told too many people about it except for my small circle, you. Um, that's it, really. A couple other people. So my show gets to be the big reveal. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I almost don't want to like show it because it's, I, I think it's what most people would call a blob squatch at this point. Right. <clears throat> and honestly, it doesn't matter how much I've tweaked the video. Mm -hmm. I mean, I put everything to it to, to just, slightly bring out the subject but it just nothing does anything to it it's, it's insane well i know when i saw it uh i i had looked twice yeah i was like what the heck yeah and i mean i being a paranormal investigator i took it as a ghost mm -hmm. but you know from the the theories that i've heard in the cryptic cryptid world is that um bigfoot has some kind of a i don't know a translucent type fur that helps yeah. it to to blend in with its surroundings i mean i'm, I'm probably not explaining it right well from the samples that that uh people have taken the the actual hair itself is is the core is completely different than ours so it does act like a translucent todd could probably tell you a lot more than that uh, than i could to be honest with you yeah. i know you're working on a, on that theory aren't you todd i'm working on a couple theories and and I'll tell you what spawned this direction I've turned to, and, I, and that is that I'm, I'm, I had some amazing encounters, plural, uh, about a year and a half ago, and it blew my mind. Um, if I were to come to either of you two guys and said, how would you like to see Sasquatch tonight? You'd like me going, oh, okay, that'd be great. If I came to you and said, how would you like to see it five nights in a row? You'd probably be locking me up. <laughs> right. But uh, there was there's a phenomenon that I had put into the paranormal category. Uh, Anytime somebody comes up with some sort of a paranormal or supernatural ability that they associate with Bigfoot, the first thing I say is, all right, show me one example of any other animal on this planet that has that characteristic, and then we can talk. And so when it came to uh, this phenomena, which is the eye shine, that it's been reported widely and I've seen video and everything, but it's one of those things that you, you just have to see for yourself to believe. I thought, okay, I'll, you know, I'll be Huckleberry. I flew out to uh, Nebraska and uh, uh, was not prepared for what, what I encountered. Uh, I was invited by members of the Omaha Indian reservation to uh, come up there and do some investigating on the res. And <clears throat> I was there for a week and we went out in the field five nights in a row. Um, we generally wouldn't get to a site until about midnight. 
and we wouldn't leave till 2.30, sometimes 3 in the morning and in pitch black. Uh, they took me to the initial spot, and I, um, we pulled over in a very remote spot right along the Missouri River. Uh, yeah, 90% of Nebraska is like you picture it. It's all flat cornfields and soybeans as far as you can see. But right along the the Iowa Nebraska border is the uh, well. What divides it is the Missouri River, and and that west side of that Missouri River belongs to the the Omaha tribe. So we get out there, and it's a two lane road, one lane each way, and only one place to pull off. Uh, otherwise, it's guardrails. Um, we pull off onto this what looks like an access to an old logging road. We park, we turn off all the lights, we walk across the road. We're looking into literal, literally pitch black darkness. I mean, you can't see the hand in front of your face. And my native friend would yell out into, into the darkness. He'd say, oh, ho, kage which means hello friends. And they'd say gigaho, which means come closer. And I'll be damned, gentlemen, if I didn't see <laughs> two uh, lights close together, look like eyes to me. Now I couldn't wrap my head around it as far as being bioluminescent, such as a firefly or some aquatic creatures or, or bioluminescent algae. Uh, nature can do that, but uh, likewise, I could not believe that it was projected per se. And I've come full circle in terms of hell yeah, that that phenomenon exists, and, and somehow they're doing it. And I've um, I've been talking about it at some conferences that I've attended this last year, and it's uh, it's it's the tapetum which is the reflective layer on the back of animals that have night vision. It's, it's between the, the um, retina and the optic nerve, and it amplifies light by reflecting it back through the, through the eyeball itself. And I believe that, you know, there's light, whether we as humans can see it or not, whether it's uh, twilight or, or lunar light, a zodiac light, there's light. It's just we're limited in, in compared to animals that can see in the dark, right? But right. if they are if they are amplifying uh, to the level that we can see it, then I think that's what what's being observed, and that's what I think. I mean, like a camera, the larger the lens, the more light you can draw in. Right. Well, imagine an animal with eyes the size of tangerines, and how big that lens is, yeah. and that eye that whole chamber in there. Um, I think that's what we saw, but I mean, it wasn't just the eye shine. We saw two up to three different animals uh, at any given time, but it was also the vocalizations that, that were coming out of the darkness that were just mind blowing. I mean, the first one we heard was, it sounded like, I'm pretty sure it was a female because it was very high pitch and of course very high volume, but it was like a song. And that's the best way I can describe it. It was like a, a chorus, uh, if you will. And it changed in volume, notes, pitch, all within about five to six seconds. She would take like a 10 second break and do it all over again, exactly the same way. And this happened four times within a minute. And every time it was identical and, it, you know, we're not talking some arbitrary howl, scream, roar, whatever, whoop. We're talking about repetition. And when there's repetition, there's meaning. And where there's meaning, there's a language. And it, I, it wasn't frightening at all. In fact, it was very welcoming. And I, I think that's probably what was going on there. It was just like my friend had been establishing this relationship for two and a half years at that time. And uh, they know they knew him. They knew his voice. And when he called out to them, they were like, here we are. Well, this went on 
five nights in a row in two different locations in pitch black. One time it got, we, we were getting some activity, not as much as another time and, and earlier nights. And my friend said, I got another place about four and a half miles from here. Let's go check it out. And we went, we're taking my rental like Toyota Camry four wheel drive. <laughs> I'm like, where are you taking me? I mean, we were blazing, we were blazing a trail. I mean, the grass was higher than the hood of my car. Oh man. I didn't even know if I was on a road or not, but you just like, you know, we finally break out onto this, finally break out onto this logging road. Like again, a whole new, whole new uh, location. And again, turn off all the lights. We don't even have our cell phones on. It's just pitch black. And he does his call. And sure enough, right in line with the road, maybe 150 feet down the road, a set of eyes come shining right at us. And in fact, we caught a second one trying to flank us at about our three o'clock. Just set eyes again in the dark, going on the move. Uh, and you can see him blinking everything. Anyway, it's kind of funny because I, I asked my friend, I said, you've established a relationship, obviously. They know you. If they wanted to hurt you, they would have by now. I yeah. said, you ever thought about, I don't know, just walking up to him? He looked at me like I just ate a retard sandwich. He's like, no way. <laughs> and I'm like, hold my beer. Nobody follow me. And I start off, I don't know what I was thinking. Uh, and no, we weren't drinking beer, but I'm going, <laughs> I'm just walking straight for these eyes. I can't see the road, but I know it's lined up with the road. So I knew as long as I lined up on those eyes, I was going to be on the road, but I'm just crunching leaves under my feet. It was freaky. And I, I didn't know what I was going to do if it didn't move, you know, what if I, I mean, I suspect that if I got within 20 feet or something, I'd just, you know, cop a squat and let it make the next move. But I got up to about, I think about 40 feet away when it finally got up and turned and walked away. But uh, yeah, that Indian talks about that crazy white man walking <laughs> up to a squash in the middle of the night. <laughs> but I mean, it was a real, it was a trip, the whole thing. So getting back to the, the other topic about the hair, um, when I came back, I decided, okay, I had to eat a little crow there because I had placed that into the, into the paranormal box. And I don't generally cross into that realm, uh, unless I've got, you know, some sort of, uh, explanation for things. And so I've decided, uh, to kind of step on that third rail of Bigfooting somewhere between the scientific and the paranormal and see if I can't bring them together, if you will, mm -hmm. um, try to, you know, people say they see certain things. If it's one or two people, that's one thing. But when you're hearing it over and over and over and over again from, from a, a wide variety of people, different walks of life, there's, there's always a little truth in every, in, in everything. I, so I believe people are seeing what they claim they're seeing i just might have issue with their interpretation of what they're seeing so i'm trying to come up with more conventional uh reasons for what they're seeing and and maybe we can do a you know a kumbaya and, and kind of come together and say oh yeah told you i saw that well yeah but you said it was this but now, now we know it's that whatever but uh so the the whole, what do you, you know, the whole um, concept of uh, people saying that these these uh, this species can appear and disappear at will, and that they go into different dimensions and they, they go through a porthole or something like that. Okay, <clears throat> I never would have touched the subject except for what I saw in Omaha. And uh, so I've been looking for a scientific answer for that. And one of the things I've, again, looking for another example in nature as to if it's possible, how it's done, 
and and uh, so yeah, I think people see something and then they lose track of it. Um, these things, I think, are a master of, of not only camouflage but standing still, uh, which makes it very difficult. I know from being in the army over 20 years, movement is uh, not your best friend. Um, camouflage is, um, and so how is it people are seeing them, uh, you know, appear seemingly out of nowhere and then vanishing just as, just as, just the same. And I started doing some research and I got into the whole, uh, uh, I started looking at translucent hair. And the reason I looked at that is I've seen a couple of um, samples, clumps of purported Sasquatch hair under a, a microscope, of course, backlit with, with white light, where a certain percentage of those hairs are actually clear and, and without any sort of uh, medulla, um, so clear that you could literally see darker ha hairs that are behind them just as very clearly. So in my research, I found out that polar bears technically are not white really you know <laughs> how many people know that and uh, <coughs> excuse me um no uh they have a a well to start off their skin is black um if you were to shave a polar bear and i don't <laughs> recommend it but <laughs> you know god help you but but the, the skin is black. The, they have a, a tannish undercoat. But along with that, they have these guard hairs. You know, several, a lot of animals have that. Dogs are known for that. You've got these guard hairs that come out that extend just beyond the actual uh, base coat of their fur. And it does two things. One, one it absorbs the surrounding light as well as the ambient colors, which gives it the a whitish look, which is perfect for an animal in the snow. But um, it also transmits thermal heat down through the base coat, down to the skin. And those translucent hairs actually communicate, if you will, that heat and that light, it, it distributes down at the skin level to all the other clear shafts of hair. Wow. That's fascinating. And, uh, it's not just light and color, it's it's uh, heat as well. And in fact, uh, one scientific paper I read said that the thermal qualities are so uh, well transmitted that a 1,500 pound polar bear is difficult to even pick up on infrared. Really? Uh, yeah. Did not know that. That's just, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I can send you the, some of the some of the reports I've read, but it's it's uh, it's fascinating because I'll tell you what, when I was in in Omaha, I was not, or the, I should say the the reservation. I really wasn't prepared to go out in the field. I kind of went there on a on a whole different mission, but I did happen to pack my FLIR, you know, the TK Scout mm -hmm. thermal camera, and I took it out a couple times and aimed it at those eyes and i could not pick up a heat signature Man. and now i think i might know why yeah so anyway that's that's kind of what i'm trying to do is is put a little meaning and and truth within the myth to try to, to pull people together and go you know don't be like me and say that's all woo woo when you know you just got your butt handed to you you know but <laughs> Uh, it was so consistent. That's what really got me that in two different locations at that, that, that we would make contact every night with these creatures. And I mean, there's a lot more to it, but I don't want to hog up all your time. But <laughs> anyway, that's, that's kind of where I'm going. Um, I, there's some other phenomena that I've got to try to wrap my head around, but uh, I think it's time we, we find out the truth. Well, you know, I'm primarily in, you know, all about ghosts. That's, that's my field of the paranormal, but I know people that are really into UFOs. And then of course y'all being in 
to cryptids. And so I'm, I'm trying to, to learn those fields as well. But I've also noticed that a lot of the stories that I hear that when you see uh, Bigfoot, you'll have a lot of paranormal activity and a lot of or UFO sighting. Yeah. Or, yeah. Or is it? But yeah. Possibility of interdimensional, all this is correlated that way. I don't know. You, you see that stuff tied together all the time, whether it's, uh, like you say, uh, uh, apparitions or UFOs and Bigfoot. I mean, I don't know about all that, but, but I'm trying to make supernatural natural and, and yeah, of course. Um, paranormal normal, right? Um, I think there's a way, because there's a lot of things we know today that at one point were considered paranormal or supernatural. Mm -hmm. It's a matter of time and technology and and you know good old detective work and, and that we i think we're going to find in the long run a lot of those things that we put in that category are um, a little more understandable mm -hmm. now as a layman i i don't quite grasp everything that's going on um with cryptids so if they have this hair like they uh, they reportedly have would they be um camouflaged all the time or is it one of those deals like you know like a car that has that special paint on it where it would be you'll see green and when it passes and then as it goes a little bit further it might turn blue and turn red when you look at it a different way how does that work um well i think light is the key mm -hmm. uh, uh in darkness they don't necessarily need that camouflage so uh the more light that's involved i think the better camouflage they are they obviously aren't always camouflaged as well as what what uh, people say because i had my sighting back in 1993 where in these uh, actually saw three of them during a military exercise and uh these three creatures were standing out in the open without any trees. They were actually standing in a gravel quarry that we had just detonated a high explosives there about an hour earlier. So the, you know, not a lot of light uh, to, to cause that effect. And again, the contrast in this case, uh, had they been standing against the backdrop of trees, I probably never would have seen them, but they were standing right out in the middle of this quarry with, uh, you know, being appeared to be nearly black, if not, you know, very dark brown, but um, juxtaposed against a backdrop of, of like concrete gray uh, basalt is what it was. Mm -hmm. um, they, they stood out like a, like a sore thumb in that particular case. And like I say, I don't think this, I don't, I, I think it's light related. I don't, I don't think at night uh, they have that same capability. Um, you know, what's polar bear look like in the dark? I don't know. <laughs> well, I don't want to find out. <laughs> right. not? not, not up close and personal anyway, right? Trip over it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I find the whole thing just, it's fascinating. And I, I think it's, well, like it's good said, to know a little bit of, of all of it if you're in the paranormal that's just yeah uh, personally well, I, I think it's good to know all of it nobody's got it right yet i mean now nah. well, which i like i mean it's 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 a mystery and then someday we'll solve it and we'll have to go find another one but right now it's uh it's kind of amateur hour yeah. because uh mainstream science just doesn't want to step outside the box so that's fine with me because it gives us you know, armchair researchers, uh, something we can, we can go investigate. Well, part of all the fun of all of it is the investigating and, and, you know, coming up with all these new theories. Yeah. Um, well, and the socializing too, to be honest with you, because, yeah. uh, how many people have you met through your research and, um, and it's good to network, um, because it always helps to have a second set of eyes or ears on a, on a situation. Uh, different opinions are important. And uh, which is why I started uh, Beachfoot. I'm 
sure you've probably heard of it, uh, or at least your listeners may have, but it's this year, uh, just got back two weeks ago from our 15th annual Beachfoot wow. conference. Uh, I don't even, really, I wasn't, a, it's not a conference so much as it's a retreat for researchers uh, from all over the world. We limit it at 100 people. It's invitation only. We don't make any money at it. It's just something I came up with in 2008 is, you know, I met so many people by that time. And, and uh, there's always some, seems to be some bad attitude, uh, competition. You know, people tend to hold tight to their own research. And I thought, God, if we can get all these people in one room at the same time, what a, a wealth of, of data we could we could have and so i just instead of putting them in a room all at the same time i put them in a 10 acre campground and and made them sit together for four days and three nights around a bonfire with a adult beverage in their hand and actually get to live together and 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 over time it's uh, kind of taken on a life of its own but that's sharing is important uh, well, that's I agree. Uh, it's too much for, for any one individual. So, well, the problem in the cryptid world that I'm seeing from the outside is the same thing that I see in the paranormal field is where people let their ego get in the way. They need to leave, leave the ego at home and we're all looking for the same goal. And if we're, if we are together and we share Somebody might come up with something that you not haven't thought of, may not have thought of, and vice versa. So, I mean, we're all reaching for the same goal. So, exactly, I don't understand. Exactly. You know, you've got some out there that, you know, uh, my way is the only way, and everybody else is a fool, and blah 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 blah. And I'm sick of it. You know, yeah, I've noticed uh, crossing over from paranormal to cryptozoology. If between the two groups, it seems like the, the, the Bigfoot group is the most divided and there are some of the most mean, <laughs> hateful people that lurk in the background, never, never have never had a chance to, to go boots on ground, get in the field, you know, walk through grass that's above your head, you know, trying to look for answers, but they always demand answers and it's like, say some of the most evil things i'm just like god what is wrong with you people but it's like paranormal a little bit more friendly a little bit more laid back you know well here's what i think blah 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 you know and and bigfoot bill it's what do you take that video with a potato you know it's just some of the most ridiculous <laughs> things i've ever heard i'm like god what is going on here i don't get it man well when i first when i first got into this uh, back in well 93 uh, when i had my epitome my epiphany rather the like rude awakening to oh yeah they don't exist oh, there they are you know um i was part of keep in mind it's 93 we we're part of one of the first internet online groups that were was ever established back in 93 and there was probably about 15 of us on it and uh uh, internet, I don't remember what we even called it, but anyway, yeah, it's, it's just exploded over time. And, 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 you know, there's groups anywhere, take a map, throw a dart. I'm pretty sure there's a group or a conference there, <laughs> but I've got involved in a couple other projects that's trying to, other than Beachfoot, that's trying to network people together. And one's called Pro, uh, Project Zoo Book. I don't know if you've heard of that. Um, no, that's that by clever. <laughs> well, what, it actually makes more sense than Beachfoot. Uh, I mean, <laughs> name-wise, um, which is another story. But it's uh, Amy Boo from Ohio uh, and some of her friends uh, learned that there were some zoologists and in particular primatologists in a certain city I won't mention because we're kind of protecting their identity with this kind of an agreement we had, but we found out there was a group of primatologists working in actually a couple of different zoos that had a fascination about Bigfoot. And then they met us and it's, oh my God, 
here's some Bigfoot here that have a passion for primates, and maybe together we can uh, share things. So uh, we meet regularly online, and and uh, but we're talking to scientists now. We're talking to biologists and primatologists and sharing information. They would say, oh, well, they do this or that. And they're like, that's funny because that's exactly what orangutans do or yeah. whatever, you know. So we're, we're, you know, comparing notes. And then the other project was called SHARE, which stands for Sasquatch Hunters Academic Research Exchange. And in that case, we're still kind of, I mean, Amy kind of jumped the shark on us because we're trying to bridge the gap between amateur researchers and professional scientists. Mm -hmm. And we realize the scientists, they're not going to lower themselves to our level. It's a matter of us raising ourselves right. to their level. So we have put together some 36, 37 different SOPs based on science and not particularly Bigfoot. Um, how do you write a scientific paper? And if you write a scientific paper on a, a you know, a purple spotted, frog in the Amazon, you should be able to use that as a template and take out frog and put Bigfoot or whatever they call it in that area and make it read just as scientific as any other species. So learning to write scientific papers, uh, figuring out how to get them published, um, uh, but taking science in general as a, as a template but what do researchers in science do? So we're trying to bridge that gap. Uh, and like I say, we put together some 36 different uh, SOPs. So we, we're gonna put them out. It's gonna be an open source uh, uh, website where people can say, hey, I wanna fly a drone. What's the best way to do it? And you get in there and here's, here's the best way to do that in order to get, uh, sorry, I gotta plug my power back in. But in order to get it, advanced to a level that that you can sell it you know to to the scientific community so between project zuba beachfoot and uh share um we're working on getting people talking that's great that's it's good, good. Uh, you know we should uh, i think there's too many people out there looking to get famous doing this instead of doing it for the right reason which is yeah. you know Let's find out if this is for real, for real. Um, but anyway, I don't want to get onto that. I'll, I'll, I'll rant on that for an hour. <laughs> <laughs> Forget now, the competition. Yeah. Let's take competition and make it cooperation and yeah. networking. That's right. And I think we'll find the answers. You know, and part of me wonders if people, if there are some people out there that really don't want the answers found because they find so much intrigue in the mystery you know, it's like, oh, my God, what if we actually, you know, what if some truck driver hits a Bigfoot or we find a body that died of natural causes or what have you? you know, a lot of people say, well, then it's over. The mystery is over. Well, no, you know, as far as I'm concerned, that's it's that's uh, round two. It's it's a yeah. new chapter. And, and it's all and new questions. Could... Exactly. Yeah, that's. But now I want it. I want to find answers and and. Uh, I love mystery, and when Bigfoot gets solved, I'll go chase some other critter. I don't know, but right now I'm enjoying what I do. I just retired from the Army three years ago, and I finally, you know, got time to do what I've always wanted to do. So um, I asked myself, what do you want to do? I'm bored I'm, you know, <laughs> after a month of not reporting, you know, for duty and yeah. uh, wearing that uniform every day and having to shave and then uh, – I had a little conversation with myself. It was like, what do you want to do with the, you know, you should have thought about this before you retired. And uh, it's like, okay, well, I've been in the Army 20 years, I was vice president of a company for nine years. I was a lab tech at Intel for five years. What have you done the most? Of? Well, I've been drinking for Bigfoot for 30 years. So let's run with that. So, yeah, it's, it's, uh, I'm trying to step up my game a little bit and, uh, and uh, try to get the word out, spread the good gospel of Bigfoot. Yeah, I would love to make that a full time career. Yeah, but I have to I currently have to keep punching a clock until I can find a way to break out. <laughs> well, Thank you, you go, Death. Cash in that insurance. 
Yeah, That's there you go. my mind, man. <laughs> <laughs> now, before oh, we get into... I'll be the, your alibi. All right. <laughs> before we get into the video, I, I wanted to ask about the intelligence of uh, Bigfoot. Now, are we talking intelligence on the line of like a, a primate? Are we talking like human or beyond? I'm thinking... Well, if, I, if I could, I'll tell you, sorry to interrupt, but... Okay. Uh, I hate to tell you, uh, humans are classified as primate. Okay. A lot of people make that, don't make that distinction because uh, we think of primates as monkeys, but humans in biological terms are primate. In other words, they're the prime of our, of, of the mammal species. Uh, but I, I, I understand what you're saying. Yeah. Um, but I, I digress. Go ahead. Uh, no, I, yeah. I mean, these creatures, uh, whatever, I mean, they've, they've been doing nothing but surviving for hundreds of years, thousands of years, who really knows. But, uh, I mean, it's it just mind-blowing that uh, how, I mean, I don't even know where to begin, to be honest with you. It, there's just, uh, there. Let's see if I can help you out because yeah, this please. is another. <laughs> lot of, my train of thought. Well, it's another um, theory I'm working on, and, and in fact, um, I've been including in some of my talks, and and that is, uh, what is intelligence? Okay, for us humans, we we measure intelligence in terms of uh, well IQ or the intelligence quotient. But if you look at intelligence, can you you know where it's based on calculation and based on. Um, based on mathematics and based on technology um, and deep thought, that kind of stuff that, that is more academic that we've developed over years. Mm -hmm. But in, in reality, we've exchanged, we've surrendered what I call PIQ, which is primitive intelligence quotient, the, the AIQ, is what we consider IQ today. And that's, again, academic intelligence quotient. Now, back it up. When you get into hominids, you were looking at Cro-Magnon, we're looking at Neanderthal or Denisovians, that where were they? And, and could you put them up on Jeopardy? You know, they're not going to know where the button's at, but they don't have the same level of technical academic knowledge that we deal with does that mean they were stupid i mean what what were they in comparison to say um giganopithecus or, or uh australopithecus or anything of those days it's 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 a everything is relative and in, in the case of early hominids that relativity was based on you know what adam said is survival skills because that's that is what led this species we call Bigfoot or Sasquatch or Satanga or uh, <laughs> there's a thousand names, but that's what allowed them to survive where Neanderthal died out. Okay. Because these are the ultimate survivors. These are very robust, built for survival. They have been around hundreds of thousands of years, I assure you, 23,000 years uh, of interaction with humans here in North America. They just discovered a, uh, evidence of a, uh, by carbon dating, they, they had found evidence of a, a village that dates back prior, this is important. Uh, I have a friend, uh, Kathy Strain, who's an art, uh, anthropologist, and they found about this time last year, they found the oldest settlement of humans in, in North America, and they dated at 19,000 years, which is critical because what happened 20,000 20, years ago, and we know that from taking core samples went out, there was an ice age. Mm -hmm. So is that to say they came on after the ice age? Well, now, I think it was November, they found... <laughs> They've now located one in, of all places, Oregon, 
that's 23,000 years old, that's, that's critical because that means humans were here, and I'm talking Homo sapien, before and after the ice age. They, we've been able to, we survived an ice age. Well, big deal. These things probably survived several of them. And so in comparison, primitive intelligence quotient versus modern day academic intelligence quotient, who's really the smart one? Right. Well, it's going to take one thing to prove who has greater intelligence, because again, everything is relative. If Korea or China or Russia imploded or exploded a, an EMP device over the United States, imagine everything electrical from not just AC, but DC, all batteries, all, we can't pump gas, we can't refrigerate food, we can't, we don't have lights, we don't have transportation, we don't have hospitals, we don't, guess what? Guess who that doesn't affect one iota? Yeah. So who now who's the most intelligent, right? Right. Who's the most intelligent? Survival of the fittest. It's exactly. not survival of the smartest. And it's 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 really a difference between book smart and street smart. And these these creatures uh, can run circles around us out in the woods and in an EMP or anything similar to that. It it's like so. We'll just go on living the way we've been living. And <laughs> right. uh, so sad, too bad for you guys. Let's pull up that video, Mr. Adam. Yeah, I find this, I find this interesting. I, um, we definitely got something on camera that you were kind enough to share with me just before we came on the air, but uh, it's pretty cool. All right. And once again, I'm going to put the, the, the video at the end of this so people can see it better than what we're seeing it right now. But kind of explain what's going on here. So we're basically um, this major interstate heading back from uh, Austin to um, Houston. This is actually just east of Flatonia, Texas. And um, as we're driving along, um, I didn't actually see this thing until it got to probably the corner around here somewhere. And this is actually kind of blown up a little bit. Um, this is looking out from my windshield. Um, let me move it over just a little bit. So there's a dark spot here. I don't know if you can see it or if your viewers can see it. This dark spot just under, just above my pointer mm -hmm. is, is the creature in question or the, whatever it was. Um, and I didn't even see it at that point. I saw when my headlights actually hit the knees below as we got closer. Um, so we're moving along and you see it kind of becomes translucent. <laughs> you could see it running. Yeah. That's the crazy thing. Yeah, so the more you look at it, you can see it running. I didn't know what I captured because I thought, okay, it's probably like a hitchhiker or something. But as we got closer, I, I saw it. And what was more vivid was where my headlights were shining. And that was just looked like a, uh, a light tan furry whatever so i thought it was like first thing that crossed my mind was like there's is that somebody in a ghillie suit but i know in this area because i'm i'm uh, constantly researching um bigfoot sightings there have been a few in this this area but it was like years past so Hey, Adam, that yeah. light, just uh, there's some sort of reflector, I believe, just to the left of the circle there. Right here. Does it, does it, I didn't, I didn't look at it before. I was just curious. Does it block that as it goes yeah. past it? It, do, it does block it, but then you can kind of see through it. So it's like a, it's like a warped. Um, so. Boom. Oh, yeah, it's, it's so fast. I can't. And these uh, things, these things are extremely fast. And it, I don't know what the refresh rate is. 
Uh, I'm assuming you're at what, 1080p? Uh, yes, sir. No, this okay. was actually taken 4K. 4K? Okay, but, 4K. Yeah. Kyle. Yes. I, ask you do, I want to ask you to do something because something I observed right, right before we came on. Mm -hmm. I want you to move your hand. I want you to move your hand in front of your camera real fast and see see what I'm looking at. Yeah. The now you'd have to see your own, but I'm saying it blurs out because of the speed and the refresh rate of the camera, and that may be what we're looking at because these things can. Yeah, uh, there's definitely something there. Yeah. But these you, things haul. These things haul butt, you know, and they will. Yeah. Uh, it's hard to catch them on film sometimes for that reason. Or again, if we were looking at, yeah, definitely. Let we're looking at a, a different player where I can actually scrub the video. It'd be well, great if you could slow it down. Yeah. So when I watched it, my first thought was, oh my God, he's caught a ghost. But, uh -huh. you know, listening to y'all's theories, I think, well, is there something to this? with the you know the the special hairs and you could see it obviously running it's definitely going against traffic for sure oh yeah, yeah. and it's and it seems to be there it looks like there's a bit of a grade between the lanes and between the embankment to the right mm -hmm. so it's probably aren't going to see a lot of the yeah i was gonna say you're not gonna see a lot of the lower body or the legs so much but yeah, there's definitely a mass of something moving left to right and, you know, kind of coming at quarter, quartering uh, toward you. Or right, here we quartering go. away. Okay. Let's try this. All right, so now I can actually control. There we go. Nice. Mo better. Now you start to see it come into to view. Yeah. See how it blocks this? This this is a, yep. a reflector also. So it blocks that reflector. Yeah, and then it comes back on. Yeah. And let's see the next now, one. You see, you can see it looks like there's legs moving. Uh, hold on. All right, I'm going to put my eyeballs on for this. What's going on here? Let's see. Uh, well, I gotta let it play through once. Sorry. I mean, when you see it in real time, I mean, in you know, without him pausing it, you can see it running. The stride on it—that's crazy too. Yeah. So that's either a Bigfoot, right? Or... No, there, yeah, yeah. I blocked it. It right. definitely blocked. It blocked that reflector. I, that's the first time I got a good look at it. But that reflector that comes up, there it is, and it does literally block out that reflector. Uh oh, what you're, happened? You're right, you're just in front of it. Yeah, I'm having issues with. You need to pay your cable bill. Oh, there it is. <laughs> right there. It's just coming yeah. off of you it. You yeah, see that. it blurring out the background? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Good catch. There it is. Good catch, my friend. So it's either a Bigfoot, a ghost, or some dude's wife just caught him cheating and she's <laughs> chasing him out of the car. <laughs> it's, it's nuts. Yeah. Well, what my eyes perceived as opposed to what the camera caught was um, it was a lot more detailed. Oh, sure. Um, but you could hear me on the audio and I won't play it for you because it's just kind of embarrassing. <laughs> Raunchy. It was, it was, yeah, it was pretty bad. It was a probably a 15 minute tirade with every curse word available. Um, it was like a rap concert. Yeah, I was with my girlfriend. And she was actually looking down at something on her phone. And I was like, oh, man, it was just, <laughs> there was a lot. I was yelling. I was, and I was shaking because it freaked me out so bad. It was unexpected. 
Like I've had experiences with Sasquatch and you always walk away with something different, but this is like, I guess you have a perceived comfort when you're in your vehicle Mm -hmm. and then you see something like this and it just kind of like it, I don't know. It freaked me out. I don't know why it freaked me out so much, but it, it, it freaked me out. Just so we're clear. It's not the bug splatter there just below the circle. No, that was actually a, a moth that I, I had hit, oh, okay. unfortunately. Right. Poor guy. <laughs> now that's actually moving. Now this thing looks like it's keeping up with traffic on the other, on the, the other side of the highway. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's haul it's hauling ass, whatever it is. Can I, I say mean, ass on? You can add that out, I suppose. I've heard worse on here. I mean, you could say, oh, well, this is a reflection of uh, another vehicle, but you can see legs. You can see it moving. (laughs) Well, I think what's critical is where it's blocking out the reflectors on the side of the highway. I I can't even believe you caught that, Kyle. I mean, excuse me, Adam. Adam. That, That was, that's. That's, you know, on, honestly, it would have, not, I would not even paid attention if I hadn't a scene with my eyes, what my, my fog lights had picked up. And that was from the shin down of this woolly, hairy, matted mess. That's when I was like, wait, what the hell? And then um, as I looked up, it was a dark uh, humanoid shape. Um but I couldn't make out any features and that's what really kind of the whole thing really just kind of messed me up because it was, it happened so quick. Um, I didn't see all of this light that you see here is not there. That's, it's not what I'm seeing. I'm seeing a lot more darkness. Um, but once my headlights had picked up from the knees down, that's when I actually, it caught my attention. Cause you'll notice that whenever, um, on the audio, whenever, as soon as we pass it, that's when I like, Holy, you know, what the hell was that? And then I realized what I had seen. It was a huge, tall figure in the, it was just, it was large. It, it was large. I just, yeah, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm amazed that you even caught it. It makes me wonder how many times we individuals, uh, all of us included, just catch some of this stuff in our, in our peripheral vision and just dismiss it because it, you know, it wasn't like we were staring directly at it, but uh, no, that's a that's that's an amazing catch on your part. I just I can't tell you one way or the other what it is, but right. it, I tell you it's pretty good size and it's hauling ass and it's blocking out lights behind it, so it's, yeah. it's definitely something. Mm-hmm. So is there is that trees in the median there? No, there's no tree. Oh, in the median on this side? Yeah, yeah, those are trees. Okay. Yeah. So that that would make a difference too with the reflection on your your windshield. So right. that's why I say I don't think it's those the traffic on the other side. Well, I can actually um because after this had happened, the first thing we had done is as soon as I got home, I took the the dash cam off the camera, downloaded the footage. Um and then I mapped exactly where we were. Mm-hmm. Uh because this road, there's only one road uh, on the side here, uh, just out of Flatonia. So I know exactly where this point is. Um, and there's really no, there's some small shrubs on the right here. Mm-hmm. And uh, this is actually like a, I guess a retention. Right. Um, and these are trees right here, but I know exactly where this spot is. Um, and I've wanted to go back like repeatedly, but it's just, the the current work shift that I'm on it doesn't allow me to do a whole lot of things. Yeah. You know, Google Earth is our friend. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know that evening I got a message that that uh, Adam had caught something on the way home and I'm like oh baloney no way I, I thought he was joking with me. Yeah, he was. His responses were like, I was like oh my god he doesn't believe me. <laughs> I didn't. Yeah, I, I, no, it's fine. I get it. I get it. We, we joke a lot, so yeah. I thought he was. I thought sure. he was messing with me. And then when I watched it, I'm like, oh my god, he did catch something. Yeah. So I said, anybody that's watching this, um, the video that I put up at the end, get it on a big screen or on a, a pretty good sized monitor if you can, and you'll see it a lot better, and you'll know what we're talking about. 
I mean, I can see it right here. Yeah. Um, not as good as I did when it's full screen, but it's it's amazing. Adam, does uh, does your camera have a geocache? Yes, sir. Um, it does. Under the details. So uh, under, actually, all that's been that taken would... off. Um, I I turn all that off. Yeah, that he's not catching Pokemon. No, no, no. Right that's now. no. I totally get that. <laughs> yeah, I totally get that. But you were able to, from the geocache, be able to figure out exactly where it was. Yes. At, so. Yes, sir. Cool. Yeah. Very cool. I had a friend do that. Uh, forgot to turn it off and put it out online. Uh, several photos of a purported Bigfoot, and I had to call them up and go, you know, you just told everybody where yeah. it's at. They're yeah, like, no, I, I didn't. I, I'm a very <laughs> private person uh, by nature. Uh, yeah. And where we, we do go locally to, to hunt. Um, so, yeah, all that on the cameras, video recorders, everything's been deactivated because I don't, you know, last thing we need is 100,000 people. And don't forget your favorite fishing hole. Yes, that too is <laughs> right. <laughs> well, this makes me want to go out and really do some hunting. So when I get the opportunity, oh, I'm going with you, Adam. All right. I know quite a few spots that they frequent. If you ever come out the West Coast, give me a call. We'll That's take a you out. I've got a, actually. Hey, I've got a place. There's a lot of sightings up here. I'm actually in the Mount Hood National Forest, about 60 miles um east of portland i've got a 11,320 foot snow-capped volcano in my backyard and a lot of sightings around here but there's a place called riley horse camp that i've been investigating in fact i'm going to be going back there very soon um it's like 20 minutes from my house and wow. three I'm years there. now three three years in a row we've had um something uh, some evidence um including a sighting not by me, but another individual. Uh, really quick, well, I know we're not on a timer, and you can edit this out, but I got to tell you the story. This is, uh, I don't know if you know Joe Bielart. Uh, he's a local researcher. He's written a couple books. Anyway, he invited me up. He said, I met this couple that are that go to the Riley Horse Camp because it's a they've got a regular camp ground, and then they've got one that's got you know stalls and whatnot that you can put your horses in. Um, and this couple, Gary and Terry, uh, Terry being the wife, she, she has a couple of uh, Arabians that she takes up to the mountain here to exercise them for long endurance races, anywhere from 50, 50 to 100 mile races. And uh, so she figures, you know, if I can get them to, you know, run these you know, 2000, 3000 foot elevation changes. When I get them on the flat, they're going to, they're going to, you know, haul. And she takes them up there to exercise. Uh, Gary rides an e-bike and he follows her, but he, he doesn't do the horse thing, but they're constantly getting rocks thrown out in front of them on the trail. And this is like very, very, very remote. They've heard voices or what sounds like a language over a steep cliff that nobody, there's no trail down there that they've, they've overheard a, a language they don't understand. And, mm -hmm. um, but this one particular trip uh, two years ago, um, again, Gary has fallen his wife and, and uh, he had to cross this stream. It wasn't all that deep, maybe a couple of feet, but it was pretty swift. So he asked his wife to help him bring that you know dismount and help him get the bike across the last thing you want to do is drop an electric bike in water <laughs> right so she helps him get his bike across goes back mounts up and they both ride up to this meadow it's about a quarter mile from the main camp uh an old burn area that just got overgrown with underbrush but it's uh anyway she got there and realized she left her riding crop on the other side of the river when she dismounted and helped him get his bike across. She goes, that's an expensive crop. I need to go back and get it. I'll be back in 15 minutes max. So she leaves him there with his e-bike and he's waiting for her to come back. And uh, while he's waiting for, her, he looks out into this. Now it's just after sunset. So it's uh, 
twilight, if you will, but still enough light to see. And uh, he looks out in this meadow and he sees this dark figure about 250 feet away uh, looking at him, I guess. And uh, it's doing this back and forth, you know, rocking side to side like this. And then it would start moving toward him. And he's getting a little anxious because this thing is now 150 feet away. Oh man. It's, it's, it's closed in on him and he doesn't have a weapon on him and he's waiting for his wife to get back. And, uh, you know, he's like, this thing's coming over here. And about that time, his wife shows up. You're going to love this. His wife shows up, says, uh, he says, honey, you won't believe what I just saw. Because as soon as she came up with the horse, this thing jetted off into the wood line. He goes, you wouldn't believe what I just saw out there in the meadow. And he tells her the whole story. And she goes, oh, I believe you. I passed four of them on the way back. Wow. What? what? <laughs> That's wild. Yeah. How funny is that? That's she wild. said, I must have, she goes, I must have split them up. They probably thought I w we weren't coming back. And then when I came back, she said there were two above the trail, you know, elevated and two down below the trail on the left side. When she came back, she said, I just kept my eyes straight forward, but I clearly saw them in my peripheral vision. She's like, bingo, I got me a Sasquatch. She's like, take, <laughs> what, how about four of them? Oh, man. That's insane. I man. just. I just trumped you. But anyway, uh, they're coming back. I just actually talked to them two days ago, and they're coming back up to the horse camp. And I'm hoping before I go to Arkansas to spend a little time with them. But uh, just some crazy stuff going on up there. And it's like I say, it's, 20, it's 15 miles. It's like 20 minutes from my house. And, yeah. uh, wow. But anyway. Well, let's get some of those folks on the show, man. Tell their story. Yeah. Yeah. I, I know people would I'll, love to I'll, hear it. I'll, uh, I'll let them know. I'll give them your contact information. I well, appreciate or that. Give you theirs either way. Anyway, hey, it's been fun. Hey, it has been awesome. Uh, thank you for, for joining us, Todd and Adam. That uh, that evidence is just incredible. It is absolutely incredible. And uh, Now, you both in Texas? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, so, uh, well, I should have known by that answer. Um, <laughs> Y'all so polite down there. <laughs> I'm starting to pick up this Arkansas accent from my girlfriend, but you know, <laughs> it's hard to shake. But anyway, uh, I'm scheduled to speak at two conferences next summer in Texas, and uh, hopefully we can hook up. It just That's kind of sure. depends on what's what's going on with the filming of this um, this series. But um, yeah, so love to meet you, absolutely in person, and and maybe go out and kick a few few rocks see what's under them yeah oh yeah and take you for some of this good old uh, texas barbecue absolutely oh now we're talking <laughs> <laughs> well guys um i, I can't thank you all enough for coming on and sharing your time with me anytime and uh happy to do it we uh, can do this again in the future uh, well thank you for having me anytime anytime and for all of you out there, if you are new to the channel, thank you for stopping by. Please subscribe and come on back. For those of you who are regular to the channel, thank you for your support. It's because of you that we do what we do. So until the next one, everyone, please take care. Be kind to one another. God bless and peace.
I'm looking at this giant figure, huge, eight feet tall, non-human gait. I'm trying to classify what this thing is, but it, it's not real. And I know what it is, but what it is is not real. The arms of these things went well below their knees, unbelievably long arms. When I looked up, there was a young male looking at me. Something's going around my tent. It stops behind me, and then contact. We tried. We really tried to get pictures, but these things seemed out foxes. Something, something is leaving footprints. As you start utilizing the data and you start seeing the data tell the story, the whole story unfolds right before your eyes. The way it pulled its little one, its young behind it with its arm. I mean, I can't even put it in words. It was so unreal. Knowing about them, they seemed too intelligent for me to like consider them as like something you could go out and hunt like an animal. That is, whoa. So these were brought here. I had one client talk about how muscular it was and how broad its shoulders were and how it's like just was in awe of this incredibly majestic creature. You will always have that with you. You will always remember that moment. When he was walking away, I called out to him, you are the most beautiful creature in the world. Please don't go. I was that person. I did not believe. I just thought it was a myth. Open up your minds because they're out there. Paul Boy.